Welcome to Homemakers No Dig Garden. End of winter going on spring. There's so much I'm sharing with you here about what's coming up and ideas and what we can do and this lovely rising energy. I'm certainly feeling it now. Spring is coming, so getting ready for it. Uh, just before we dive in, I'll say if you want to hear from me in person about this kind of thing and how No Dig works, I'm giving two talks in Cornwall, beautiful tree bar gardens down near Falmouth, 23rd, 24th February. I'm doing a day course in Madrid, 2nd of March, and I'm doing a little tour of Suffolk, actually, in the second weekend of March in multiple venues. So <laughs> let's see what's going on in here. The propagation, this, this is why we're starting in here, because outside it's still too early for sowing seeds direct, but you can do a lot, what I call undercover, so that means in a greenhouse, or if you haven't got a greenhouse, it could be in a polytunnel. If you haven't got either of those, what I am actually doing at the moment, we did a lot of sowing yesterday, none of the trays are here. That's because they're in the house. Um, I do the first phase of germination, say a week, in that extra warmth, especially at night, which you get in the house, and that germinates the seeds. And then when they need light, I'm lucky enough to have this greenhouse, they come out here. And these are some sowings we did earlier. These are not the regular sowings, because I'm always saying don't sow anything in January, but we did sow these in January, because we're trialing compost. And it's actually been so interesting, because these these six trays of turnips are all different compost and the results are pretty similar and I would say that's really encouraging for anyone watching because you know don't fret too much about getting the perfect compost and it doesn't have to be sterile some people say it has to be it doesn't you know it's just it's mostly these just normal garden compost and the secret for me more is having a good tray so that's why I designed these trays you've got 15 30 60 and uh, the way, when we're sowing we fill them pretty full push it in firm and then I'm using that um, these are quite expensive actually but for me it's worth it if you've got if you're doing a lot it's worth it and you, you can just push it down and make the sewing holes you know you could make your own it's just finding methods that work because I do a lot everything everything I grow here except for carrots and parsnips starts life in here I'll just mention these tomatoes which are lurking in the background I mean, look at this crazy this is absolutely not from seed <laughs> don't sow your tomatoes here I sow mine in 10th of March um, but this is overwintered from a cutting I took for it's a variety that you can't get any more and it's a hybrid so it won't grow true from seed that's rosada uh, you can see videos we've put up about that and i'll just mention this this trial did show more difference three different composts home saved onion seed sown all on the same days everything's the same except for the compost so that's some of let me get this right peats peat free good compost you can buy this is the homemade uh, for that we make here and this is one that I was given actually, which is 10% worm compost and 90% woody compost. I mean, all are good. You know, if you had any of those in isolation, I'd be happy with that. But this one stands out. And what is in it, you see here. So this is Homica's roughly one year old compost sieve to about five millimeters. Um, Adam's doing some of that at the moment. We'll see the sieve as we go around. And then we've got, so that's 60%. And then we put in either that or that, and believe it or not, both of these are wood chip. This is like four-year-old wood chip, quite dry as well, but that's, that's beautiful for putting in a potting mix, a growing media. And that's younger wood chip. That's a little bit, a bit woody actually, but you know, that's okay to use, and I'd use that a bit less. And what it does is holds air in there a bit, as does this beautiful worm compost. So this is worm excretions, worm casts, vermicompost, many words used to describe exactly this. And you can see how it's got these little lumps, which is exactly what you want. If you had a mix of compost that was all super fine like that, it'll tend to pack together too much. And what we need is air in the mix. And this combination works, I'm finding works really well. And so it's, it's a kind of homemade mix. It's really nice to be doing that. This bed is one of my favorite beds at Homemakers because it's not big. It's 1.3 by 2.2 meters. Every year I crop it, very diverse range of vegetables. So I just put these sticks in to give an idea of spacings that we're going to use in rows across the bed. That's for only for planting in five weeks, not yet. I'm just thinking ahead. And I'm actually working with a, an app developer, Fruid, and you'll see some information about that. We, we're going to see if we can get this kind of looped into a, how you could do it on a phone, say when you've got an app planning, that planning stage because uh, just being clear about what you're going to do really helps and then again looking ahead this is not something we're doing yet but it's something we did because of having the oh, there's a bit of wind the um plants ready so it's like actually you know these are almost too big 
And you can see how in these small cells with not much compost, we're, we're getting a nice plant. <laughs> the roots are really keen to get down there. So what I've been doing is dibbing holes. This long handle dibber, again, you could make your own or you can buy them. Uh, a couple of, we'll put the links and look at this for the planting. Pop it in really deep. And then that, with the fleece over top, the plant stays kind of below the level. It, these went in not quite deep enough and it's tended to break them if you get a bit of wind. So I was just gapping, it's called, where you keep some plants. Don't worry if you've got plants left over when you're planting. And then if you get gaps, you know, aim to keep your beds really full. Uh, well, you get more. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get these beds already. And then you want them like this. <laughs> So these plants, we saw in the last tour actually, the salad plants that we've been picking all winter, not a lot in January. January is the leanest month, maybe twice in the whole month actually, because we had some cold weather. We, it was down to minus eight. In here it went down to minus seven degrees centigrade. That's uh, 19 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, you know, it has been quite cold at times. We put a fleece over these plants when it's really cold. That's, I think, history now. It's, it's mild. You might be wondering, God, this is incredible growth for middle of February, it's 14th of February today. It's just incredible looking at these, but they have really changed in the last week because we've had some sunshine for the first time. This is red lace mustard, uh, the favorite at the moment, my favorite because of the color. It, it only does this color as strong as this in a late winter, early spring, and then it starts to think of going to flower and you lose that color and it goes paler. Uh, green frills mustard, red dragon mustard, more red lace, and then we come to the my favorite lettuce, this is all home safe seed because it's difficult to buy now actually, but if you get one lettuce, you can keep loads of seed from it. Grenoble red, and that is just cropping beautifully. We're taking off the outer leaves. Uh, like, I could just do a quick demo here actually because this is a really nice, easy one. So pretty much, oh, this is incredible because I, I didn't pick these uh, last week. So there you go, that's, that's pretty much what's grown in a week. And, I'm really happy with that, but that's because it has been so mild. So we're going to pick these tomorrow and then we have some endive and again, we're waiting actually to pick them. They're too low on the ground at the moment, out of leaf. So all of this, that's how I hope the garden will look <laughs> as we go towards spring. At the moment, it's quite bare. The soil is not bare though, because it's all mulched with compost, classic no dig. And we put a little wood chip on the pathways and like, the only bits that haven't had new compost are, for example, where the leeks are. Uh, so we'll compost there when they've harvested probably early April. And here, where this morning I just harvested these parsnips. And I left it here to show you because it's so interesting. But this was the, the yield of 1.8 square meters. And it's nine kilos of parsnips. That's five kilos of dense food per square meter. And I actually wash them after harvest. We'll use these within a month. They will keep though. When things are grown in good soil, strong and healthy, they store much better. I find these keep in my shed, I call it. It's just a brick lean to. Um, the air is humid, that helps. And I left this one uncleaned and left the soil on deliberately so you could see. And if you look closely, you can see those little holes in the soil. It gives you an idea of the profile of home. You see it's darker there. Then we get down into the native soil you might say enriched though with compost because there's worms always coming up and down and pulling down the organic matter and that soil below is well aerated and i know it must be because we have had this winter so much rain we've had some quite extreme events like with inch of rain in, a, in an hour or two and that you never see water lying here it, it all just soaks in beautifully and the compost protects the soil the worms below busy working maintain a good structure and <laughs> I'm seeing a few weeds growing in the compost that always makes me smile. It's like, that's totally fine though, because you can see there's not many weeds here, but if I do see weeds, uh, even in the winter, that's a winter job, just removing weeds. So that compost there was quite rough. Here we have finer compost. When I say rough, that was probably only six months old when we put it on. And this was a year old when we put it on, homemade again. You can see how much finer it is. and. If I've got a surface like this, I'll think more of sowing carrots or, or parsnips um, uh, or planting lettuce, small plants, maybe spinach. Whereas plants, say like broccoli, uh, might be bigger plants and wider spacing. You can 
Um, you know, it doesn't matter so much what the surface is like. And here we got, I'm worried about pigeons. That's what the netting is for. Of course, they can always, if we had a lot of pigeons here, they could just land on top and eat through. <laughs> Fortunately, they're not. I, I don't know, they just seem not so hungry at the moment. They're doing a bit of eating. I think because it's been so mild. We're having daytime temperatures like today. It's actually 13 degrees, 55 Fahrenheit, middle of February. Wow. I mean, it's great for growth. Look at the rhubarb. That, you know, you could start picking rhubarb at this size. Uh, that's mostly variety Timply Early, which is an early type. I'm sorry about the noise, by the way. That's, um, farmers are cutting their hedges at the moment, and that's what you can hear if the mic is picking it up. And we might get bombed by a helicopter. That happens as well. This, this was um, kale that I, I just left. Uh, we, we had enough greens, believe it or not, in the middle of winter. And, um, yeah, they're still, actually, you could still pick these little shoots at the bottom. But that's what happens if you don't protect it. Um, you know, damage happens. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go this way. Here I harvested some leeks yesterday. And so I just wanted to show you that's uh, two and a half clumps of multi sown leeks what they look like in the ground and then after trimming. And I had to take off a bit more than normal because of the allium leaf miner. But these leeks are now growing away from it, from the damage. The leaf miner maggots are not eating in the winter. I think they're gonna hatch out sometime in May. I'm uh, at March, sorry, and I'm worried about my onions and spring onions and garlic going forwards. Just not sure what to do because I don't wanna have to protect everything. You know, it, it takes the fun out of gardening. It doesn't look so nice. It's another load of jobs. So we'll see what happens. This, this is um, garlic here that we planted in October. Soft neck. That's the difference between soft neck and hard neck. And you see how the soft neck, if, if this happens, I get asked this quite a bit. People say, my garlic's not as big as yours. Well, maybe it's like that. And it, maybe that's because it's hard neck. So you can see the difference side by side. Generally, I find that hard neck garlic does not grow as big. And in my case, it doesn't store quite as well. The soft neck, that's still really firm. And that's just hanging in the house, actually, to keep dry. That will be good until May, probably. These are broad beans. This is quite exceptional, again, because of the mild winter. Planted in January, sown on the 10th of December in the greenhouse, no heat. Just came up slowly, popped in the ground roughly 20th January. Wow. You can see I've given them a lot of space. This is where, uh, do, do some homework on spacing before beginning making your plan. You know, look at all the space here. <laughs> I haven't actually got a firm plan yet, but I've got lots of ideas. And obviously I know my spacings and that kind of thing, but these kinds of things it helps to know because you'll know then how many plants you'd need to fill up a bed, for example. Here we have rye, and that's what it would all look like if, if it was going according to plan. And you can see that some of these beds are not looking brilliant. And that is wireworm largely. I don't know why, but we've got a lot of wireworm in this area and it likes the rye in particular. It's rye for grain to make bread. And the stalks you can see are mustard that's been killed by frost. And that was to deter the wireworm. It, it does make a difference, but not enough. <laughs> and also we got rabbits. So that's what's grazing the rye there, where the, just where the net has come loose so i'm not actually too worried about that because i noticed last year they did that they're, they're a bit more hungry than normal at the moment and then they leave it alone and the ride just comes back here we have new no dig so what you've seen so far is that th those were beds made a year ago this is ground that was a month ago just like what you see around i call it weedy pasture so it's rough grasses dandelions and above all creeping buttercup we've got a lot of buttercup here and you can see it and the dandelions actually the dandelions here poking through already so this compost has been on two weeks and i got a two meter cube load dropped here by a small lorry adam spread it out and then same procedure for the mushroom compost on top so that's four cubic meters on roughly 60 square meters to give you an idea and that's a lot of compost but for starting out it's only a starting out dose it's not like every time and it i can buy it reasonably cheaply there's probably about 180 pounds worth of compost there i don't know how that sounds to you guys it might sound a lot but if you think how much food you can grow in an area like that i feel that's worth it and that's not every year you know every year we're putting on just that much new compost 
And then here is a completely different compost. So when I say compost, it, you know, it's, it's all variable stuff. It rarely looks perfect. Don't worry about your compost. Don't fret over compost having bits of wood in that kind of thing. Even the worm compost here, this is what this is. So this is worm excretions. It's, when we sieve it, it's like what you saw in the greenhouse at the beginning. It's beautiful stuff, but what we're struggling actually at the moment a bit is to get it dry enough to put through the sieve. Uh, worm compost by definition is wet because that's how the worms like to be. They don't like living in dry compost or even on top of dry compost. It's from my in-ground wormery. You can see a little short video I put about that, about how we get the wormery going. Uh, you get that lovely result, really powerful compost. And then what we're going to do over there, because of the weeds growing through, is we're going to put black plastic. So we're going to take this polythene from here. This is reusable and many times reused already. It's four years old now, this plastic. That's why it's got some holes in. That's totally fine. <laughs> and what it's been here since November. Again, because of these buttercups, this area was just solid buttercups. And I want it to be wildflower meadow like it was two years ago. Last year we had some wildflowers and then the buttercup were taking over. So this went on November and you can see where we've had to take bits off to get some, um, to put the worm compost on. Most of the buttercups and grasses are dead. Not quite though, you can just see some new grass growing there. That's a sign, if you see that, it, that will actually green up. But it's, it's set it back. There's a lot of wildflowers have seeded here. There's some wildflower perennial plants as well. And I want to spread a few more wildflower seeds there so that this all being well by May, June will be that beautiful band of color. And something we rescued from there, well, this morning, Adam, actually, he was having a little look in that pond. That, that's a wet, dry pond. <laughs> so it's not always, it was very full of water a week ago. It's gone down a lot already. He found some frog spawn, which had got dry because the pond level was falling. And look at this. So he moved it over here. And that's February the 14th, Valentine's Day. That's the classic time when we say traditionally frogs would be mating and laying there frog spawn that's already been laid quite a while <laughs> so they've been at it for probably 10 days or so and this little pond you can see again it's it's really adam's project he's brilliant at bringing plants to put in there and make it look nice and we'll sow a few wildflowers around the edge of that as well because of the mild weather we've been adding more than normal to the compost heap so this is the current heap those two are full actually, and that's why we've got the corrugated iron on, thank goodness, because we've had all the rain, it would just make it soggy otherwise. It's really good to cover finished compost. And the current heap, the heap you keep filling, we don't cover because it's just too much faff to take cover off and on. Uh, but look at the temperature. Um, again, for February, that's pretty remarkable. It's as high as I want it, actually. Uh, and partly that's because the grass has grown, so you can see the grass mowings there. And mixed with cardboard a bit, paper, anything, any brown waste that's available, including that's um, wood chip that's about only about eight months old actually. And that's sieved to get the biggest pieces out. So I want small bits of wood in the heap. And yeah, everything goes in the compost heap, including weeds. This will probably be another three weeks maybe, and then we'll need to empty out, find somewhere to put, um, you know, I can find more beds to compost to use that. There's a good ton of compost in there. It's a great way to make compost. Uh, let's have a quick look here. Uh, I want to show you the, this is such a nice site. You know, spring, that's perennial sorrel, which is coming back to life. So all through the year, it gives loads of sorrel leaves. Then it, in the winter, it just disappears. And you think, well, you forget about it really. And it's, the root is there. We put a bit of compost on the bed and there it is coming back. And just beyond it is lamb's lettuce which is actually a sowing, so that's sown in September and that's been cropping through the winter. As has the chervil here. Chervil's a fantastic winter herb if you don't know it. And the fleece just helps it. It would survive without the fleece, but actually rabbits like chervils, so this is also good protection against that. It has a lovely mild flavour of aniseed. This garlic had the mustard sown, so when we were touring last time we saw the mustard half dead from the first frost. We've had enough frost. We have enough frost here just to kill mustard. So you can sow the mustard, plant the garlic at the same time, late September, early October. Then the mustard's killed and you get the garlic. And now we're coming to a bit more about compost and the potting. You can actually just see, uh, this is where Adam's been working this morning, the sieve. 
you can get these on the internet actually they cost about 60 pounds i think that's called a 12 mil sieve uh this is one that's maybe 10 mil and it's working nicely that compost is one year old that's some of the nicest we've got uh the oldest and the sieve is basically taking out all the woody bits you know there's a lot of nice compost in there so that's for potting I never ever sieve compost that we're putting on beds. You just don't need to, you know, you can see it here, you know, lots of little woody bits, that's all great. You know, within reason, obviously, I don't want wood chip on the bed, so I would never do that either. <laughs> it's finding that balance. And these Brussels sprouts, oh, they're so cute. Um, we were looking at this before filming and Nicola was marveling at the, the, the sprout tops, they're called, like the King Brussel. <laughs> and Interestingly, the pigeons, you can see how they've been eating the leaves and there's pigeon poo as well. But they, they don't seem to be eating these, which I'm delighted by because it's one of the greatest delicacies you can eat, actually. The smooth flavour of a Brussels sprout top. This, to keep pigeons off in the winter, I always do this on spring cabbage. So these cabbage, uh, I sowed them 30th of August. We planted them 2nd of October, roughly, and they've just been there since. But what we have done is tidy up the lower leaves to put on the compost heap, and that keeps the slug numbers down, because they're always, the slugs are always eating. Let me show you a spotted one. They're always eating the lower leaves. So you say, if you compare that leaf with the leaves of the, the middle of the plant, oh, there are a few holes actually, but, Basically, you know, you get much more damage and this also gives habitat to slugs. So that's one of my main slug controls is reducing habitat. It's something to think about before your spring plantings. You know, there's nothing worse than you raise all your plants, they're all there, you plant them out and they all disappear overnight. Uh, no. So not having wooden sides really helps. There's less hiding places. That's how I see it and the practice we do here. To keep the population, there's always some slugs, that's normal. You know, I'm not trying to get rid of slugs completely, but you just find the balance so you can live with your pests. And we just reached the end of this tour anyway. <laughs> um, dig no dig comparison. It's so interesting because no dig bed, dig bed. And these were planted up. So I dug that on the roughly the 4th, 3rd of December. Incorporate the compost, two wheelbarrowfuls into the trenches as I'm digging this one. The same amount of compost goes on top. So everything's the same except dig, no dig. And we planted these Brussels, broad beans, sorry, and peas on the 7th of December. So that's two months and a week ago. And normally they would not do this. They've grown so much. <laughs> so it's been a, a kind of nice winter cover. Uh, you could call it a cover crop. With, that'll be the next video I publish actually. It'll be a cover crops or green It's just talking about them and why bother. This is quite a lot of work to do this. You know, you need to, we did propagate the plants, plant them out, uh, rather than leaving beds just covered with compost. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do the whole garden like this, but if you can do it, it's nice winter protection. And these are even just starting to flower. It's, it's incredible. But what, what I'm going to do here is, the, the, these are not for a crop. So I'm going to harvest the shoots. So basically with broad beans, you can take out that top bit and that's delicious to eat. It tastes of broad bean. We'll do that in early March, harvest all the tops, pea, to, pea shoots as well, weigh them up, it will get a result the first of the year comparing no dig and dig. I mean, these look stronger to me, but we'll see. And then cut the plants off at the base. That leaves the roots in, which is both organic matter, carbon, and in this case, some nitrogen because they're legumes. And then maybe a light raking over, the bed's ready for planting. Um, both beds the same, same story. And that's what you do now. So have fun getting ready for spring. Keep weeding, do some raking. I just raked up that bed there. You can see it's looking particularly smooth, just flicking the bits of wood off into the pathway. Uh, so it's, it's ready for new plants and new seeds. And with no dig, it's just gorgeous because you, you, know, you don't get muddy boots. You can go out any weather. I've been out here frequently after heavy rain. I don't get muddy boots and I don't sink in. You know, it's just firm structure, enjoy late winter, early spring.